Hey, welcome to Advanced Child Protection Part 2. This is pretty much my story, and uh, you know, I hope you guys are really learning from the things that I put into Part 1, and this is going to be just a continuation of Part 2. I'm going to try and finish it. I hope I do. But I had so much go on, you know, being married to a female child molester it was really difficult. And uh, so what I left off was that my... Uh, wife was now taking my daughter up to spend the, the weekend with, you know, her younger friend who was two years younger. She was 12 years old. The friend was 10, you know, and the older brother was probably, I don't know, he was like three years older than my daughter, whatever that would be. So he'd be like 13 or whatever. And, you know, I didn't know that he had problems. And, uh, you know, if anything hap did happen up there, I, I never heard about it because I didn't realize at that time that my wife had been talking about my daughter. Oh, I'm sorry. Had been talking to my daughter behind me, you know, and encouraging her along with, you know, this other little girl to, you know, get involved with boys, you know, saying things to her that just, you know, how cute this guy is. The same thing she was doing with that little girl I told you back in the last part who was only three years old. And this is what I didn't realize was that my wife was going to psychologically molest my daughter. I had no idea, you know. You're not taught about this kind of stuff in school and when the psychiatrist told me in 1984 that she would molest our children in ways that I didn't understand, um, boy he was right, you know, he was right on the money and he didn't tell me about this way and if he did I forgot about it because we're talking this 20 years later now, you know. So yeah, I mean, what a rude awakening to read it in that book, you know, The Wounded Heart. I read all kinds of books about, you know, women that were molested as kids and the things that they do and, you know, what to watch out for. But it still wasn't enough to help me understand the psychological aspect of child molestation and what females do to set up their own kids. So, you know, all I know is that she was putting my daughter together with other children who'd been molested. And I didn't realize at that time that what she was doing was not only putting her with the, the younger daughter, but she was making the acquaintance with the older boy who had serious problems. You know, and he'd been in prison for raping other little girls, you know, since he was nine years old now at that time. You know, and he'd just got out and and he was only out a short time, then he had another problem and ended up getting put right back into prison again. So we're going to advance this now. Another year. My daughter's 13. And uh, sometime that summer the kid had gone out of prison again. And, uh, and still, you know, and I'd ask her, you know, isn't this, isn't this the bad, the bad John? Because we had two Johns, and I'm just using different names. So, so we had two Johns that were about the same age going to the same church. And I, I'd heard in the background that one of them had serious sexual problems. And the other one was fine. So I was asking my wife, isn't this the bad John? She's going, oh no, this is the good one. The other one's the bad one. And tell me stories about him that I'd never heard. You know, and I didn't have any idea at that time that she was once again lying to me to get to my daughter in those ways that, that I, I had no idea was happening, okay? And so this kid, you know, comes home and she tells me, oh yeah, you know, John, he's coming back up from L.A., he's been with his dad for the last year, you know, and uh, Amarina's is going to go up and spend the weekend with, with her little friend again. And I'm like, you know, I don't really want that to happen and this and that. And, as long as there's an older boy in the house, I don't know. I don't care if he's a good John or the bad John. The fact is he's not going to be the John staying the same night in the same house as my daughter ever. And it's okay if, you know, the little girl comes down and spends the night at our house any time while he's up there. But I don't want our daughter going up there and spending, a, you know, a night with a teenage boy in the house that we don't know, especially at, at, a, at the age of 13. And you need to understand that at 13, um, my daughter was full grown. She was completely and totally, you know, full grown. In fact, she was basically done. You know, she might have grown maybe a little bit more over 13 or 14, but in our family, um, your body is done growing and you're fully developed by the age of 12 to 13. 
So I here I had a um, a physically fully developed daughter at the age of 13 who just mentally wasn't developed there yet at all. And the last thing that we needed was to let some kid get a hold of her, okay? Because her body's already running with the hormones saying, woohoo, you know, it's time. Because that's how it is in our family. We really have to watch out for this. The same thing was with my mom. The same thing was with one of my sisters, you know. I mean, we all were totally full grown by the time we were 12 years old, you know. I mean, I grew an inch in high school. You know, my daughter basically stopped growing when she was 13, 14 years old, and she was done. She was full grown, you know. So we needed extra protection for her because, I mean, there was all kinds of guys looking at her because she was, you know, extremely pretty. She still is today. But the fact of the matter is, she was full grown, and this is what the 7th and 8th graders, you know, saw when she was going to school, you know, and in that 8th grade year, she really came on and started coming on to guys. And I'm like, what is going on? I couldn't understand why all of a sudden she's just running after these kids, you know, and she was boy crazy. And, and I, I didn't put two and two together until later that it was my wife that was telling her the same thing that she was telling that three-year-old. It's like, hey, man, isn't he a cute boy, you know? And what did she actually say to my daughter? I don't know. I wasn't there because I was working all the time and thinking that my wife was protecting our children instead of setting them up. Okay. So this kid comes back. He gets out. And, you know, the next thing, you know, my daughter's going to go spend the weekend up there at, oh, no, 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 no. The first thing that happens is we go to a summer camp, a church camp, you know, with the, with our church up in Al, up in uh, not Alta, Scotts Flat Reservoir, and uh, this kid is up there, and the next thing you know, and I had no idea that my wife had been putting them together before that, so I go up there and see it firsthand for the first time that my daughter is just, you know, head over heels in love with this kid now. And they're kissing and making love, and, you know, just kissing and, you know, following each other and, and just doing things that are completely and totally inappropriate for a 13-year-old. And I go to my wife and says, what the hell is going on? And she goes, oh, Amarina's in love. I think we ought to just let it go. I'm like, let it go? What do you mean, let it go? You know? And it was such a terrible thing, you know? Here, you know, I, I was I've kind of forgetting that my wife was a child molester. I was like, I couldn't believe what was going on. And I couldn't put the two and two together that she was encouraging my daughter to be with this kid who'd been in prison for sex crimes since he was nine years old. And he's fresh out of prison again. Okay. And so, well, you know what, we try to slow it down. I'm, I'm trying to get an evaluation on this kid because, you know, my wife's going, he has great grandparents. We know his parents are good people. This this kid is perfect, you know, and this is this is true love. We shouldn't break him apart. You know, my 13-year-old. And I'm, I'm so torn because I'm looking at my daughter and she's just really going after this kid. You know. So anyway, the camp out ends, and that's over with. What, what happened at the camp out? I don't know. Once again, I was out of the loop, more or less, you know. I mean, we had our own tents. My daughter was in her own tent. If something happened there, I don't know what was going on, you know. And, and then, I don't know, it was a, a few weeks later, maybe a little bit later on than that, that uh, my wife told me that the, the kid had gone back down south to be with his dad again. And I was like, thank goodness, you know, that's over with, you know, because I didn't approve of this kid calling her up, you know, all times of day and night and back and forth, and, you know, the love going on with my little eighth grader, you know, and uh, so my wife tells me that, you know, he's gone and everybody's going to go spend a weekend up at her friend's house again, and I'm like, okay, that's fine, as long as he's gone, no big deal. The next thing you know, I get a phone call from his grandpa, and he's screaming at me over the phone. 
Reed, what are you doing? Let your daughter come up here and be with John. You know, you know what he is. You know you can't let your daughter loose around this guy. We just caught them in bed together. And I'm like, what? What are you talking about? He went back to Los Angeles. Carol told me that, which is my wife's name, of course. You know. She goes, Carol? No, Carol knew he was up here. Because she's the one that took him up there and dropped him off. Dropped my daughter off at this house to stay the weekend with this kid. You know, my 13-year-old. And that's when I found out from his grandpa that this kid, you know, had serious sexual problems, that he'd been in prison for a long time, that he just got out and he just got caught not having sex but fondling, and they were about to, you know, have sex by the babysitter that was there to watch the younger daughter, who was now upset because she was being pushed out of the picture as my daughter was moving in with this other guy at 13 years old. Kind of a twisted story, I know, and it's uh, it's kind of weird because I didn't realize at that time that, that because my wife was pushing my daughter into it, she was turning her on and turning on my daughter's hormones at a young age to where she would want this guy. Okay, well, we, we killed that right there, and, and, you know, his grandpa, his next Vietnam vet, and me, we just let him know that that was never going to happen again. And he was never allowed to even be around or call or even speak to my daughter again. And uh, so he ran away, went to Sacramento and raped another 10-year-old and went back to prison. <laughs> you know, because he was so mad and so heartbroken that he had just had to go out and go to a party in Sacramento and rape some other little innocent little girl. You know, and that's what happened. He went back to prison for that. And, uh, well, the abuse was still going on, though, because now, because I had separated her from her true love, you know, she hated me. And she still pretty much hates me to this day, you know, for doing this to her, for separating those two and for separating her and her next boyfriend. You know, it was just, was I an overbearing father? No, I was trying to protect my daughter from sex offenders that my wife was pushing her into. Okay, and this is what I said, my wife was gonna do anything. If I wasn't gonna allow my wife to to do it, you know, in front of me and molest my kids, and she was gonna do everything she possibly could behind my back to let somebody else molest them for them. And so here we are, it's another year later um, my daughter is 14 years old, and I walk into the grocery store, and this lady walks up to me, and she goes, Are you Reed Lucas? And I go, Yeah. You know, you know your daughter, Emma, she's going out with this guy. You know, and that this guy is, is bad news. And I'm like, uh, I know she has a new boyfriend, but, you know, as far as I know, they haven't been seeing each other. They've gone on a couple dates. And the lady goes, oh, no, your wife's been taking your daughter over to spend the weekend with this boyfriend of hers now, with this new boyfriend. We'll call him Jared. And, uh, and, and she goes, and she goes, and you need to understand, Jared's already destroyed the lives of five other girls. He takes them. He makes them fall in love with them. He takes their virginity, and then he makes them want to get rid of him and dump him, or he dumps them. Either way, they get dumped. He gets real mad and real mean with them. And you want your daughter to have no part of this boy. And that's how I found out my daughter had a new sex offender boyfriend. And uh, so I went to uh, my wife immediately. It happened to be like a Friday night. And I asked her, I said, where's Amarina? And she goes, oh, she's spending a night at her friend's house. And I'm like, okay, what friend? And she goes, oh, just a friend down in Colfax. They're going to they're gonna be together all weekend. And I, you know, said, look, this is what I heard about Jared. Okay, where is Amarina? I want to know now. Well, she's spending the weekend at Jared's house. I go, why didn't you tell me the truth in the first place? So this is what I'm saying. My wife and I were really getting into it now because my wife is molesting my daughter and doing things so totally wrong that I couldn't comprehend that she was molesting her by putting together with, with other child molesters. It's like she'd go out and pick these guys 
you know, right off the website, childblaster.com. And that's one of, one of the psychiatrists said that I went and talked to later on, years later. And she goes, does your wife pick all these people from childblaster.com? Sounds like she was shopping there and using it as a shopping mall, you know, because it just kept continuing, you know. So anyway, I went down to, to Jared's house to pick up my daughter and uh, I knock on the door and her dad answers and I'm like, I'm here to pick up Amarina. I'm not going to let her spend the weekend here. And, of course, he wouldn't do it. He goes, he goes, you get out of here, I'm going to call the cops. And I said, you don't understand. You either give her to me now, or I'm going to call the cops. I'm going to put all of you away. Okay, so we got really serious then. And so uh, I had no cell phone reception there. So he went ahead, and I gave him no choice. It's like, I'm not leaving, and if I go anywhere, I'll be coming back with a police force, and I'll be tearing this place apart, you know. Because, you know, my wife has once again put my daughter into the arms of another sex offender, even though maybe he was only locally known. I don't know if he had a record for that or not. Okay, I don't know. All I know is that when some lady walks up to me in the middle of a supermarket and tells me what's going on with this kid, um, if he doesn't have a record, then he should, you know. And he ended up having a record later. So, um... I know it's pretty hardcore stuff, and it seems like I'm just, you know, rambling, but I'm, I'm, I'm giving you fact after fact after fact so you can see and not make the same mistakes that I did because what I'm telling you this whole time is the mistakes that I made by not knowing about psychological molestation and how women psychologically molest their kids and evade their husbands by telling them whatever they have to tell them so that he can't find out the truth. And this one thing she would keep stressing to my daughter is, don't tell your dad, don't tell your dad. You know, and that way she could put her way in and be my daughter's best friend as she's, you know, setting her up with these other boys and saying, go ahead, you know, have sex, you know, experiment and learn. And so uh, I'm standing there in front of the house. I went up the driveway a little bit to wait for the sheriff's office because the the dad, he wasn't about to shoot me or nothing, you know, he was actually pretty good people, you know, and uh, he thought I was some kind of child beater or something, I don't know. So the police officer shows up and I told him what's going on, I said, my daughter's in this house, and I just found out that she's staying overnight here again, okay, this would be the second time now, and, uh, you know, it's it's like, I go... I go, I don't want my daughter to spend the night here. I already told him once, no. Okay, and here she is. She's over here again to spend the weekend with her new boyfriend. And this guy has serious sexual problems. He's already taken the, the virginity of, of five other girls at that time. Or no, it was four other girls, and my daughter was going to be the fifth. And that's what this boy was doing. He was doing his best to work his way into her pants and go from there. And so... Uh, the sheriff's officer goes down there, and about 20 minutes later, he comes back up to me and goes, uh, Reed, um, we need to talk. Your daughter has serious problems. And he goes ahead and he hands me his card, and he hands me the card of the, of the district attorney. And he goes, your wife is molesting your daughter, and I'm going to arrest her right now for reckless child endangerment. And... Uh, He goes, what I need you to do is go down to the district attorney's office or go down to the courts or whatever it was first thing in the morning, tomorrow morning, and you file a restraining order on your wife and take the kids away from her. And then I want you to call this person, the district attorney, and he gave me the name. And he goes, you won't have to tell him anything but your name because everything's going to be already on file. He's going to know about the case, and we're going to put your wife away. We know she's molesting your daughter. We've seen it enough times to know what's going on. And all of a sudden, my mind just went, Phew. And I put two and two together immediately about what my wife was doing emotionally to my daughter. So I looked at the sheriff's officer, and I go, look, I'll take care of it. And I said, I didn't realize this is what she was doing. You know, I've been dealing with this for 20 years. You know, 
so I got my daughter out of there. The next day, the sheriff's office goes in there, uh, a full crew of sheriff's officers went into that house and tore that place apart. Let the parents know that that kind of thing would never happen again in their house. So, and this is where we, you know, got hardcore, you know. Um, at that time, I went ahead and, and chose to not, you know, I chose not to put my wife away because I love my wife and I gave vows to protect her. You know, and I that was the biggest mistake I ever made was not putting her away right then. I'm going to have to come back and tell you about that. So, yeah, if any of you have already dealt with this kind of thing, the police were already involved, stick with it and just go ahead and put your wife away because that will just save you a whole bunch of heartache. And the rest of the story I'm going to tell you is just so bizarre. Okay. That night when I got home, or the next, the next day after school, when I got home from work, my daughter was upstairs in her room, and I went up there and, I apologized to her for what I had done, you know, and I said, what's going on? This is so wrong. I said, I don't know what's going on, but you need to not be spending the night over there. And I just broke down in tears and I apologized because I'd actually used the police to separate my daughter from her boyfriend. And boy, she hated me then, but she loved me so much. You know, she saw me in tears and she broke down and apologized herself. And it was just a, a very emotional moment that should have never had to take place, but I didn't, even still at that time, you know, I hadn't put two and two together until the night before that my wife was molesting my daughter. Okay. And so what I did was, is I did not call the police the next day. What I did was I called the, uh, the church counselor, um, who I thought was a really good licensed counselor at the time, and I didn't realize nobody told me that he'd been molested as a kid. And this is the guy that I talked about at the end of number one, who was uh, sexually molested by his mom when she gave him to her boyfriend. Okay, so I took my daughter, I took my wife to go to counseling with him first. And we told him what had happened. I told him the police were involved. And I said, do we have to go to the police? Because they pretty much give me no choice. It's like, you know, they're like, you know, we're going to arrest your wife, but we need you, read me, to press the charges, you know. I mean, did they really need me to press the charges? You know, I don't think they did, but because it was me, because my family is fifth generation around here, and because, you know, the, the guy took one look at me, the sheriff's officer, and knew that I was dealing with some serious stuff, you know. I don't, he didn't know I'd been dealing with for 20 years. But when I told him I'd handle it, I meant I'd handle it. And that was the biggest mistake I make was thinking that I could. Because I didn't have what it took to handle it at that time. Um, not even close. You know. And uh, so he thought about it, this counselor. We call him Jay. And... Uh, we went back to counseling with him the next day or the next, you know, a few days later, whatever the next appointment was, it was maybe a day or, or two later, you know. And I go, well, do we have to get the police involved? You know, and I was just so, just so worried that I was going to get the police involved. I had to put my wife away, you know, that I, and I was so relieved when we walked here and said, no, I think we can take care of it right here. <sighs> I mean, just a rush of emotion just kind of faded away, and it was like, man, thank you, Lord. You know, I didn't know if I could handle putting my wife away and, you know, becoming a single parent with the hours that I was working and this and that, you know. It's like, you know, I screwed up. Okay, I didn't do what the police officer said. Go down and file a restraining order. Take the kids away. Then go ahead and go to the district attorney's office and they're already gonna, they already had the reckless child endangerment charges, paperwork, and everything all done. And it was waiting for me. And I never showed up. The number one mistake, the biggest mistake I ever made in my whole life is what I just told you. 
So we kept going to this counselor. Then we took my daughter in there, and she was hating me. I mean, she hated me big time because now not only had I separated her from her true love, the sex offender who was back in prison after raping the 10-year-old, but now she hated me because I'm trying to separate her from her boyfriend, and her mom is just telling her, oh, I know, you love him so much. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll make it so you can be with him. And this is going on behind my back. And the next thing I know, after counseling, my wife comes up and says, um, Amarine and I are moving out. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. You know, you can move out, but you can't take her with you. You know, not after what you've done. And she goes, well, we're moving out and there's nothing you can do about it. And I go, well, you know, I can call the cops and this is what's going to happen. I said, you've already, you know, stepped way over the line here. You know, and I still didn't know what she was doing was child molestation. And I said, what you were doing to our daughter is so wrong. I said, I don't know what the name of the crime is, but it has to be a crime. It's so terrible what you're doing, pushing her into these arms, these other guys. You know. And she had a friend named Jeanette, my wife did. And Jeanette had this uh, little uh, grandma's house, grandma's apartment. And she'd already told my wife that she could move in there anytime she wanted to. And now my wife supposedly was going to Jeanette's house and taking my daughter there. And I'm like, you know, why don't you just go ahead and pack your bags and get out. I'll raise the kids on my own. You know, because obviously you don't, you're not fit to be a mother. You know. And we're just going at it because she refuses to go to counseling. Every time I say it, and reminding her now that she has problems, you know, that she's already been classified as a child. Now she goes, I've never been to a psychiatrist in my life. And this is what the psychiatrist had told me, that she was going to forget that she ever visited and that she would deny it for the rest of her life that she ever went to a psychiatrist in the first place or was ever even, you know, diagnosed. So she went out and she was buying, you know, this bipolar disorder, worst case scenario, was out buying more things. She was buying curtains and stuff for her new place to get it all fixed up. And I'm like, okay, so where are you moving to? And she goes, you know, I go, are you moving into Jeanette's house? You know, and, and I just did not like Jeanette because, you know, she's putting herself between me and my wife and my family. And, you know, if she's believing whatever story it is that my wife's telling her. And she goes, no, Jeanette's mom moved in. We're moving, we're moving somewhere else. I'm like, well, where are you moving to? Or we're moving into Jaron's parents' house with him. So now she's taking my daughter, okay, to move in with her and her mom into my daughter's boyfriend's house. Okay. What do you think I did then? Do you think I was just a nice boy? Boy, I went off, man. And I was like, I'm calling the police right now. This is it. I've had it. I'm not dealing with you anymore. I've, I've put up with enough. I can't let you do this to our kid. You know. And I'm telling her about this. And we'd already had the argument, you know, about what the lady had told me in the store. And uh, she's telling me how their childhood sweethearts, we need to not break them up, we need to just go ahead and let it go. That he's the best thing that she could possibly ever have. My 13 year old, oh no, no, I'm sorry, my, my 14 year old daughter. Who then had just turned 15. Okay, so now my daughter is 15. She's still with the same guy. Well, my daughter, you know, didn't get to move in with him, and it was for the best. And I pulled my daughter aside at that time and said, you know, look. This is when I told her that her mom was mentally ill and that things were going on here in this house that were completely and totally unacceptable. You know, I didn't tell her at that time that my wife had been molested. And I didn't really understand what was going on still. But I was telling my daughter and the counselor, Jay, he was telling her and trying to calm her down because she, she not only hated me, but she was now because she was being defiant and violent and completely and totally rebellious, I guess anything I had to say, she was going to go have sex with this kid, whether I liked it or not, when she had the time to do it. When he finally got the way to get into her pants. 
and there was just I was I felt so helpless and like I said if I would have called the police and never gone to this counselor that would have been fine okay because I didn't know that he'd been molested himself as a kid and I was told later on by a professional psychologist the leading professional psychologist in this area in this town that because the police were already involved he had no choice legal choice but to call the police immediately right then we were in the office that first day and that's what he told us you know he he'd said you know I need I need to call the police right now and I'm like okay and I sat back so we sat there and he got the phone and he you know he picked it up and he set it down and goes let me think about it you know said more than likely I'm going to call the police and, but then when we went back in there a couple days later he said he didn't have to call the police and boy he, he broke the law right there you know I could have taken his license away from him you know and I still could I mean the, the guy just screwed up all the way down the line because I kept going to him because he had now reeled me in because he was a good talker you know and I thought he was doing good and honestly he was doing me good personally as my own personal counselor but my wife wouldn't go to him my wife wouldn't say nothing to him she wouldn't even fill out the paperwork when I was trying to get her to go with him and so uh, what I ended up doing was bringing um, Jared's dad in to counseling with me and my wife one day and this was probably Oh, maybe a week or two after the incident, you know, because once again, my wife is going to start taking my daughter over. Not only take my daughter over to to spend the weekend now, she was moving into that house with my daughter. Okay, and so I pulled in um, Jared's dad's name. I, I can't remember, but I pulled in Jared's dad into counseling with me, and... Uh, we got in there and the three of us sat down, you know, myself, my wife, and and Jared's dad, and, and the counselor, Jay, he just went off on this dude. What do you think you're doing? And he just basically, you know, make a long story short, you know, the dad apologized sincerely. He said, I had no idea how serious this was and what, what was going on and how wrong that it was. And he's looking at my wife and says, how could you even consider moving into our house? You know? And he, you know, gave me a big hug, and he, and he was in, basically almost in tears because what he'd done was so wrong, and he couldn't put two and two together that I wasn't this great big bad guy. And see, this is what was going on. My wife was out there telling him that I was just this, this terrible person and that we needed to separate, and she, and she was saying that we needed to get her daughter out of our house and away from me into a safe environment, you know. And... Boy, I'm, I'm telling you, I had no idea my wife was doing this to me behind my back. I had no idea. I found out years later, years later, that this stuff was going on for years. And because it was, she was working in a different crowd than I was, she was going to this church, you know, and pretending to be Little Miss Perfect Christian, you know, the beat-down woman. These people all had complete and total sympathy with her, and they didn't know who I was. So when I walked into the church, you know... They were like, you're Reed Lukens? You're the person that she's saying is this big, terrible guy? And I'm like, uh, what are you talking about, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, yeah, because I was just dumb. I was stupid. And I let my wife get away with child molestation. Um, so my wife was never allowed to move into that house. And Jared's dad made sure that my daughter never spent the weekend there again. But... The same thing happened to my daughter that Jared had done to the other four girls. He went ahead and he took her virginity and then started treating her like crap and let her understand that she wanted to dump him. You know, and I never forget that night when she walked home after he'd taken her virginity. You know, the look on her face, you know, I can still remember to this day. You know, it was horrible. It was horrible. It wasn't a pleasant experience for her at all. You know, and then a few days later, they were done because he got what he wanted and he moved on to his next victim and uh, you know 
I look, all I can do is look back and not cry now. It's just so hard because there was so many days I just sat there and cried about it when I first realized what I'd done, the mistakes that I had made by not, you know, sticking with the police, by going to a Christian counselor who I thought was experienced, and unfortunately he was way too experienced in the, you know, in the art of child molestation himself, having been a victim, you know. But you know, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. This kid got his, okay? He got his. He ended up taking out a lady who was on a motorcycle and killing her, you know, with his grandpa's Corvette or whatever it was. And he ended up going to prison for that. And, uh, yeah, so I felt, you know, justification and gratification after what had happened for that. So I'm going to let that story go because that's pretty much it for that part. But the one thing he did do was uh, start telling everybody that my daughter was a whore and stuff around school and spreading out that she was easy and so on and so forth and uh, she ended up getting my um, he ended up getting my daughter you know molested or raped again by a kid that actually came right up here to my house my daughter had gone ahead and she'd asked to spend the night in the guest house with her friend who was visiting her from Hawaii this was her friend's first day here and I had no idea that there was anything going on between her and Jared because he was now her bitter enemy. And uh, so I said, okay, that's fine. And so she goes up there and she has her cell phone because, you know, I provided cell phones and so on and so forth. So I get up the next morning. It's my very first day of my vacation now. My daughter and her friend are spending the night up there in our guest house. And I walk up there to get my, my mining gear ready because I have a guy that I've never met before. And... Um, at that time, I was really, really well-known um, gold miner throughout the world. And I had a guy coming here from Arkansas to go gold mining with me, you know, that day. You know, and we ended up becoming, you know, best friends, this man and me. But uh, I go walking up to the guest house, which is right across from my garage, And uh, that was the guest house, says the Lucans on the side. And that, you know, when I was driving up here in my other video, my the one that shows the house and stuff. And uh, there's this kid standing out, you know, on the deck in his boxer shorts. And it's like 6 o'clock in the morning. And so I went ahead and went over to the garage and looked for a baseball bat or something to beat this kid to death with. You know, and I'm just like so torn. It's like, my God, how could she do this to me, my daughter? You know, after everything I'd gone through for her, now she has a boy up to spend the night with her. You know? And I didn't realize that it wasn't her at that time. This kid had called her and called her and called her all night saying, look, I'm going to come up there and see you. You know, and blah, 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 blah. And, uh, and you know, she finally said, okay, you can come up and, you know, just come see us. And, then, you know, he ended up molesting her. You know, and was it rape? I don't know. Unless she knows that. All I know is that later on, that counselor told me she was raped. Whether this was the time that she was raped or another time, you know, it happened later. I don't know. But somewhere in the age of 15, my daughter got raped, as well as being dumped and her virginity taken by this other kid, Jared. And now this other guy was, you know, molesting her too. And that only happened once because instead of killing him. I went down there and introduced myself and started talking to him and I found out who he was and uh, first thing I did is I went and I called Doug uh, which is Jared's father you know and I told him this kid came up here to spend the night and I wanted to know what the hell was going on and it just so happened this kid I don't remember his name was supposed to be spending the night at Jared's house with him and snuck out of their house and come up to my house to molest my daughter and boy, was Doug pissed, man. Shit hit the fan. Because we were pretty good friends now. We're seeing eye to eye. And he's starting to see things going on with his kid are completely and totally underground. You know, and he's not knowing about all the stuff that's going on with his kid. Kind of like me. We're both being, you know, the fathers on the side instead of the fathers that are completely and totally involved because we don't understand what's going on in our family. You know, and I don't know what was going on in his family as far as what made his son want to go out and destroy the lives of all these girls. 
including my own. Okay. So, next thing I got a call from the, that kid's parents, and they totally apologized, and, you know, what do you want me to do? And I was like, well, I just want you to beat the living crap out of them, you know. But I never want to see him again. I never want to hear about this again. And they're like, yeah, no problem. <laughs> you know, and uh, so, yeah, we, we just quelled that situation. My daughter was crying. She was in tears. I didn't realize that she'd been raped. You know, I came back down here. My, my buddy from Arkansas had come up. I mean, that was the one reason, the number one reason I didn't go to prison that day for murder. That's the only reason is because this guy that I didn't know had come all the way from Arkansas to go gold mining with me. <laughs> you know, and I didn't want to ruin his day because I knew my daughter had already lost her virginity, you know, a month or so before, a couple months before. You know, and she was just a, a problem child then at that time because she hated me and just, you know, I was the bad dad from there on in because I was never there for her. And this is what she'll tell you to this day. I was never there for her. I never did anything for her. And here I'm out there protecting her from her own mom in ways that she doesn't even understand. You know, and when I'm trying to tell her this, that she needs help, that she needs to, you know, go to counseling and anger management and see psychiatrists and so on, she's just blowing off saying there's nothing wrong with me as she's going down to other schools and beating the crap out of some kid who broke up with his girlfriend who was one of her friends and just, you know, ended up getting a jail record and so on and so forth. And I should have put her in a home. My wife kept saying, no, no, we can't do that to our daughter. And I'm like, you know, not realizing even still that my wife is completely and totally involved in what's going on with my daughter as far as setting her up with these other kids. So another year goes by. And here again, what tells me there's something wrong? Okay, I knew there was something wrong instantly when I saw that look in my wife's eyes on her face and that excited look that I'd seen, you know, when my daughter was three years old at her, ground, her mom's preschool, when my ex-wife was sexually molesting that other little girl that I told you about in part one. There, once again, was that face I hadn't seen. Something was wrong, and I didn't know it. And I'm like, what are you doing? She's like, well, I have to go to work. And I'm like, what do you mean you have to go to work? Because I made more than enough money. She didn't have to go to work. I was giving her all kinds of money to go spend, and I didn't realize she was not only spending it, but she was putting it away. And she had, you know, $20,000 in credit card debt she was trying to pay off all the time, and I, I didn't realize she had credit card debt going on, too, now, because... We had agreed when I paid off the $15,000 credit card debt a few years before that we would never have credit cards again. Now she'd got three new credit cards and a school loan, and she had $20,000 more in debt. And where that money went, I don't know. You know, I just assume it was drugs. You know. So anyway, something's just telling me. You know, I've got this sixth sense. You know, like I said, I'm. You know, I'm just a man, but I do the work of a guardian angel, man, and I have been for 30 years, protecting my wife from herself, man. I mean, you, you feel so wild, and the stories that I'm going to be telling here are, are just all so true, and I've got witnesses. That's the only stories I tell, the ones that I have witnesses for. You know, because otherwise it's just too, people would believe it, just, you know, throw it off and say, oh, he's just crazy. You know, fortunately, I've got witnesses to back up my story. Um, so now my wife has two jobs. There's nobody to take my daughter to work. And this uh, tow truck driver named Mickey is going to be giving her a ride to and from this Burger King up here. And uh, I'm like, what do you mean? That's your job. She goes, oh, no, this is a great guy. He's a, he's a great person, man. He's I completely and totally trust him. There's nobody my daughter's that our daughter is safer with than with this, this Mickey dude. So I'm like, uh, no, I don't think so. So I ended up bringing Amarina down, and, and I just knew something was wrong, so I went ahead, and that's the first time I went to Meganslaw.com. I mean, Meganslaw.ca.gov. 
and I pulled up the file of every child molester in this area and up there at the Burger King in that area where she was working. Because my daughter is 15 now, she has a job, you know. Um, she's going to be 16 soon, within a few months, but my daughter is still being given rides to work by, my mo by uh, her mom back and forth. And, uh, yeah, I mean, this is pretty heavy, man. So I pulled my daughter downstairs, you know, and I said, Amory, you know, I just got this bad feeling, I, you know, and I want to be a good dad. I want you to go ahead and look through this website with me because I want you to know who these different child nurses are and who we need to watch out for. And so we start going through the list, and she goes, oh, I know him. I've seen him before, and this guy, I've seen him before, and I've seen this guy before, because she works at Burger King, and this is a Burger King where a bunch of 15-year-old girls worked. I think the youngest age you could work is 14. So there was 14s and 15-year-old girls working there at this Burger King, and, and it didn't. I didn't realize it had become Child Molester Central. So next thing you know, we get to the M's, and there's a... My daughter screams, oh, God, that's Mickey. And I go, what do you mean? Mickey who? And she goes, that's the guy that Mom has given me a ride to work. And I'm like, what? And I go, yeah. And she goes, yeah, he told me he'd been to prison, but he didn't say it was for child molestation. So I said, is there anybody else he's going after? And he said, yeah, he was going after Tiffany today. Another little girl that was up there, he, and he's told her this 14-year-old, beautiful little 14-year-old girl, that he wanted to take her down to the lake and see her in a bathing suit, you know, and he was telling he was going to pay her money to go ahead and, you know, come on down and go swimming with him and spend a, spend the day with him at the lake, you know. So here he was going to go molest this little 14-year-old, and I didn't realize he had all kinds of girls. My daughter said he's got it, everybody up there. Just when we see him, we run to the back room because we don't know what's going on. And here, Mom's got me giving rides from him to and from work. And he's bringing them to my house. <laughs> you know? And that's it. I went ahead and uh, Emery just happened to know Tiffany's number. So I called up Tiffany on her cell phone and we had her turn on her computer. She, In fact, I think she already had her computer on. And I gave her the web page number and we went right to Mickey. And I pointed out that this guy's a child molester to right there to the 14-year-old the girl that night on the phone at the same time. And when I got done telling Tiffany that she needed to be sure to stay away from him, I asked her, and this is I'm talking to her on her own personal cell phone, I go, is your dad home by, by any chance? And she goes, yeah, he's, he's out in the other room. I go, would you mind if I talk to him on your cell phone? She goes, no, I'll go get him right now. And so, you know, I'm talking to her dad saying, I'm pointing out to you know, her dad, who this Mickey dude is, right there. He's got his, he's got Mickey in, you know, 3D right there on her computer, his daughter's computer, and I'm telling him about this child unless she was going after his daughter. And I said, you know, and we, and after we got done talking about it, and I said, look, man, this, obviously this guy's, you know, been in prison for less than what it said on there was, I think, uh, a child under the age of 13. Um, I said, when we get done, um, we both need to go to the police. He goes, oh, I'm not going to go to the police. Not yet. I'm like, okay, what do you mean? He goes, I'm going to go pay a little visit to this guy. <laughs> and I knew exactly what he was talking about because I'd already talked to my brother-in-law and we had decided to go pay a little visit to him ourselves. So, Mickey was in all kinds of serious heat and he didn't realize it because, you know, I mean, my sister is a secretary to the Attorney General. I got two brothers that are um, prison guards and anywhere he gets put in prison I have complete and control you know total access and control of his life you know and I just want him dead you know because that's just how I felt about child molesters back then I just want him dead but uh, my brother talked me down and he you know brought me down and cooled me off and said look we'll go talk to him and we'll let him know I mean, here's this guy, he's 47 years old. He doesn't want to be going back to prison for the rest of his life. It's against the law for him to be talking to any person under the age of 18. You know. But he couldn't talk me down that much, and I said no. <laughs> I said, I'm just going to call the cops, the heck with it. 
It's like, okay, you do what you want, man, but I hate to see you just putting some guy away that maybe he's not that bad of a guy, you don't even know. And I'm like, it doesn't matter to me, he's going to jail. You know, so Tiffany's dad went ahead and, she, and he called the cops. I went ahead and I came home and I told my wife, I says, look, this Mickey guy you got Amarina going to work with is a child molester. And she just went off of me. All you do is try and ruin everything I've done for our daughter. Everything I try and do, you're destroying all my plans. You know? I said, can't you, and she's like, can't you see I'm trying to follow what God's telling me to do? God wants Amarina to be with Mickey. He's a great guy. And I'm, you know, so we're sitting here in this argument, and I said, no, I'm going to call the cops. And she's screaming at me, my wife, you can't do that. You can't do this. I have worked so hard to put them together. The lights came on, and there it was. She admitted it herself that she had purposely tried to put my wife with my daughter. Did my, da my daughter ever hear about this stuff? No, my daughter had no idea what I was doing for her behind her back. Even to this day, even to this day, I get calls. Or, you know, a couple months ago, I got a letter from that, um, from the, you know, the John, from back when she was 13 years old. And here she is, she's 23 now. And I get love letters from this guy every now and again for my daughter. And this time, you know, here he's like 26 or something like that now, <laughs> you know. And he's writing her telling, oh, you know, your parents should never tore us apart and blah, 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 blah. And I went ahead and wrote him a letter and just let him know that you don't ever want to deal with me again. And uh, so anyway, back to Mickey. I went ahead and called the police. You know, but it was at night because I was working a night shift at that time. There were these shifts that I was talking about that, you know, Two swing shifts, four to midnight, doubling back into two day shifts, then doubling back into the two graveyards. So I called the sheriff's office at night, figured I could go ahead and get in, but they didn't have time to take down everything. But I talked to the officer for about 20 minutes and gave him my story about what Mickey was doing, that he was going up there and he was, you know, trying to get to the girls up there at the at the Burger King and so on and so forth, that he'd already gotten into my daughter and was giving her rides to and from school, and they went and they talked to him. And they let him know that, that would never happen again or he would be going back to prison. And Mickey fell out of the picture, and that was that. And I didn't have any more problems for a long time. You know, my daughter was um, very rebellious by then. She was doing things on her own. She was coming home just beating the crap out of her little brother. She was emotionally battering my, me and her mom just so terribly, just beating her mom down because she knew that no matter what we said, whether I said yes or no to what it was she wanted to do, that she could emotionally batter her mom and get her way now because her mom was going to give in to her to be her friend. So my daughter ended up getting molested by my, by my wife in ways that I didn't understand. And uh, she started becoming really, really violent to the point that I, I finally had to move her out of the house just after her 17th birthday. Went down and rented her apartment, and she moved out and uh, never to return. You know, and, and it was, she was never welcome to return, okay, until she was willing to get help. And that was the problem that I was having is she was unwilling to get help or listen to me in any way, and she couldn't understand that her mom had done this stuff to her. And I didn't have the, the heart or the knowledge to tell her exactly what had happened to her. You know, I mean, I tried to tell her, but she just would not listen. Just, I mean, she was extremely, extremely violent towards me to the point of where one day she, you know, called me out and she was going to beat me up. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. I'd had enough. I threw my hands up in the air and I walked outside. So she'd go ahead and beat me up. She says, come on, hit me. Go ahead and hit me. You know, because she was extremely violent. I was like, look, you know, I love you. If you really, really hate me that much that you got to beat me up, then just go ahead and sit and start hitting me. I can take it. You know, hit me as many times as you want. I'm okay. And I sat there and put my arms behind my back, and I stood there and waited for her. You know, the next thing I know, the knives come out of her pocket, and she throws them on the ground, and she screams at me, I hate you, I hate you. You know, I have to hate you, you loser. And just going off on me. And my son's in the house listening to all this because he's just in terror of her because, you know, in his own words, she's going to kill me, Dad. She's going to kill me. She wants me dead. 
and she did. She was beating the crap out of him on a daily basis at that time. You know? And so she, you know, goes in and gets her stuff and screams out of the, out of the house, gets in her car and goes, because, you know, she's 16, I guess, now, and has her driver's license or whatever. And, uh... Oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. Yeah, no, she was 17. She just turned 17 when we had this big fight. And I couldn't take it anymore. I was done dealing with her and trying to get her in for help. I couldn't take it. She was emotionally battering me terribly. Now she wanted to stab and kill me out in my own front yard. Um, she was coming in just hitting the kid as hard as she could when she'd walk through the door. Just completely and totally violent. And uh, so I looked at Abraham and go, what would you think if we went ahead and just, you know, packed up your sister's stuff and moved her out? And you got the smile on her face. Goes, yeah. And I'm like, okay, good, let's go. So we went ahead and we went down to the store and we got boxes and we went up and packed up all our stuff and put it out on the front porch. And when she got home, she was done. She didn't live here anymore. You know, we were going to move her down to her grandparents, but we ended up getting her an apartment. And then we ended up getting her another apartment because, you know, she was learning life the hard way. That she couldn't have it her way. So, because the first apartment we moved her into, she turned into the party pad. You know, it was a non smoking apartment. <laughs> it wasn't the greatest apartment, you know. And she ended up bringing all the riffraff in for parties, you know, and all of her high school buddies who used her and were smoking and were doing dope. And this kid was throwing up outside of her door. And, you know, within the first three weeks, um, she got thrown out of her own apartment by the landlord. So we had to get another apartment. And she learned a valuable lesson there that, you know, maybe dad wasn't all that wrong, you know, and that people were using her, you know, in every way. And so uh, she went to her next apartment and she gave up all of her old friends and she started her life over. And she's been working her way up ever since and doing a great job of it, you know. But it took to get to that point to where she finally hit her lowest low. They got thrown out of her first apartment within a month before she started listening to what we were saying. So, that's pretty much the end of the story for that part. Um, I'm going to go back into Mickey again because Mickey was a child molester and, uh, and what he had done is he raped a nine-year-old girl. Okay, this is a full-grown man. And it was really weird because, you know, just how things worked out, I ended up going to his hometown. And I had property over there. And so I was approached by this group of people who wanted to have a party on my place at the river, which is where I shot my PTSD video. And uh, and so I'm talking to the, one of the main guys, and I go, oh, maybe you know it. You know, I said, my, you know, my daughter was molested by a guy who grew up here, and his name is Mickey so-and-so. Um, you know, maybe you know him. And he goes, Mickey? And so he goes, you know, yeah, he molested your daughter? And I go, yeah. And he goes, and he goes, I know all about him. And he starts telling me how he had uh, been bragging, you know, about it all over town. And I'm here with a group of people. I mean, this guy is here with, with a group of his, of, of his people wanting to have a party at my place. And, uh, so I find out about Mickey, about how he'd molested this nine-year-old, you know, and how that he was always bragging all over town about how she gave him permission, you know. And I'm like, this guy's a child molester, and I point this out to him, you know. And they were kind of sitting there with smiles on their faces. They, they, they all, a lot of them knew Mickey, you know, because he was trying to become part of their gang, you know, or part of the, you know, part of their crew anyway. And... uh and I go, do you guys have a lot of child molesters working for you? And he looks at me and just like, no. So let me put into perspective what he's trying to tell you that he did. And I said, so here's this little nine-year-old girl. You know, she's three and a half, four feet tall, maybe a little bit taller, depending on, you know, he could be anywhere from four feet tall, maybe four or five, you know. And here, Mickey's a big man. He's over six feet tall. I think he's like six two. You know, I can't remember what it said on childmuster.com, but it was something like 6'2", 180 pounds or something like that at that time, you know. 
Maybe it was 220 pounds, I don't remember. But anyway, so here's this little tiny girl, this little nine-year-old, who does nothing but trust everybody that comes into her life. And this is what I told those, these, this whole group of people. I said, and so here he goes, and he asks this little girl for sex. You know, hey, can, I, can we have sex? Let's go ahead and have sex. And she's like, okay, I don't even know what sex is, but okay, I, I know I trust you because you're an adult, and I'm supposed to trust you. And uh, so he takes her out, and you know, even if he was an average man, because she's so short, when he's sticking in and ramming her, you know, it's going to be beating right up here into her chest, right into her heart. And this is what I told these people. So here he was, you know, this 35-year-old, or however old he was when he molested her, you know, just banging into her. And every time he rammed it in, he's hitting her in the heart, hitting her in the heart, hitting her in the heart, hitting her in the heart. Until she doesn't know what's going on. You know, and what they ended up doing was forming that first little icicle in that girl's heart from being stabbed in the heart so many times by this guy's penis at the age of nine. You know. So this group went from being smiling and happy to where every one of them had tears in their eyes now and the women were just crying uncontrollably when I brought them into the realization of what it was that Mickey had done. And uh, to make a long story short, there was no party. They didn't, they didn't have the party down there because he was going to be the drummer at the band and I said, I want no part of this. And so that never took place. And the fact of the matter was, you know, God put us together so that I could hear what happened and I could make sure he didn't get into that group and I could help people understand the truth about child molesters and how they work. Here this guy had got this little girl to say yes by doing the same thing my daughter, my ex-wife had done. You know, come on, you know, I love you. You know, I love you with all my heart. Come on, you know, have sex with me. You know, probably had that same big, huge, loving smile on his face that he would have for all children because he loves them too much. What happened to Mickey when he was a kid? I don't know. But child molesters are created by being molested themselves as kids. This is why I have a heart for Mickey and everybody like him, for Carol, my ex-wife, and everybody like her, because they've gone through hell as children, and they can't see that what they do is wrong. You know, Mickey went to prison. He did his time. He did his 10 years for molesting that 9-year-old. You know, and I stopped him from molesting the girls up that the burger came by letting the police know, you know. And uh, and so this was this was just here a couple of years ago that I found out the truth about Mickey and what he had done. And I put it into real perspective for these people just exactly what's going on and what child blessers are and what they do by telling them a lot of the story that I told you here already. Uh, when my daughter was 17, and she got thrown out of that first apartment and we were moving her into the next apartment all of a sudden Mickey showed back up on the scene again okay and my wife was all encouraging him to be with my daughter again okay and now because there was no washer and dryer in my daughter's new apartment you know my 17 year old's new apartment and she had just turned 17 she was like two months into 17 Um, here comes Mickey with a brand new washer and dryer that he's going to put into her apartment. And I just went off again. And I went to my wife and said, look, you can't be taking anything from this guy. He has no business being around her. And she's like, I don't know what you have against him. He's such a great person. And the same thing that she was saying before and trying to push my wife into this, kid, into this guy's arms. You know. So I went to my brother-in-law. And, uh, and, and he went off. I mean, he was a prison guard. And he goes, look, this guy is a child molester. What he wants to do is put the washer and dryer into Emma's house so he can show reason for entry, so he can go in there any time that he wants to use this new washer and dryer. This is how child molesters work. Once they have reason for entry and it's been established that they can go in and out of that house, then all he has to do is say, hey, 
you know, she said it was okay and we had sex. You know, because my daughter, even though she was only 17, you know, she was acting like an adult. You know. And I wanted to put him away again. But, uh, it didn't go that far. What I ended up doing was we ended up completely and totally taking Mickey out of the picture that time. Oh, yeah, that's what I, yeah, I wrote him a letter saying I knew exactly what he was doing with, uh, you know, showing, trying to show reason for entry and that it wasn't going to take place. And uh, when it was all said and over, you know, I went to my daughter and said, you know, did you ever have sex with him, you know, back in the day when he was giving you a ride, you know? And she looked right at me and she said, I did what I had to do to get a ride. And, uh, you know, I never wanted to kill somebody so bad in my whole life. But you know what, I mean, I'm a good father and I want to be around for my kids and my grandkids, so, you know. This is the end of the story, and I've told the whole thing for this part with my daughter. I've showed you the mistakes that I've made. And uh, there's going to be another part to this once she starts doing it to my son. Because i got to tell it all so that you guys can see what sexual abuse other person really is. My wife did everything she could to put my daughter with other child molesters, even registered sex offenders, right off of childmolester.com. And she argued with me on every point with every person saying how great of a person they were when Mickey had molested a nine-year-old, made her believe that he was a responsible adult, that he was going to do the right thing with her when he raped her and destroyed her life and planted that icicle in her heart that she'll carry now because it was between the ages of nine and eleven for the rest of her life. Maybe it's going to go dormant for, you know, thirty years. But in her early to mid-forties, which is just you know, another 10 years away, okay, she's going to start, she's going to start having those nightmares of when she was molested, when her body was changing the first time, which I went over completely and totally in my bipolar disorder series for spouses. Hey, you know this Reed Lukens, I've done my best to fill you guys in on everything, and uh, I'm gonna let it go from here, and that's it.